if I've done my, right in, my job right in this course, is always leads to a worry that I have, that a temptation will arise for you. Why? Well, because if I've done my job right, then I will have presented each philosopher as the philosopher themselves would have presented it. And I presented some pretty brilliant philosophers. That's why we still read them today, because they're brilliant. And if I've done my job right, then this should be the pattern that you have discovered of yourself in this course. That after we've done Aristotle, you're tempted to be Aristotelian. After we finish Schopenhauer, you're like, Aristotle's completely wrong. After we've done Nietzsche, wow, I can't believe Schopenhauer didn't see this. Nietzsche is right. After we've done Lewis, wow, I should be a Christian. But in all of these cases, if you remember our first video, I am not presenting you my view. If I'm doing my job right, I'm not here to brainwash you. I'm here to present the best arguments from what I believe are the major currents in the most important conversation that we as humans could ever have. And that is, what is it that makes life worth living? What is good? But then what is the temptation? Well, you hear all of these things, you go back and forth, they all sound great, you don't know how to respond against them, precisely because you're coming to this stuff for the first time for the most part. And so the temptation is either relativism or skepticism. They all sound great, maybe they were all right. Maybe Nietzsche's truth is true for him, and Schopenhauer's truth is true for him, and the Buddha's truth is true for him, and Lewis's truth is true for him. It all is true, but not with the capital T, true. But no, truth isn't out there. It's just dependent on the individual subject. Or you might say, no, relativism isn't true, but we can't know what is true. We have good arguments from all sides of the debate. They all cancel each other out. And so therefore we can't know anything. And that's skepticism. So in an intro philosophy course, Knowledge is always dangerous here because a little knowledge leads to a lot of ignorance. And thus, the whole purpose of this segment is to show you how this is not what I intend for you to, to happen. So now you're, you're hearing my voice. You're not hearing any of the philosopher's voice. You're hearing what, what I hope you got out of this course. And the first thing I hope you see is that these are not options for us when we do philosophy. And again, this is something that a lot of philosophers will disagree with. So here are my arguments as to why these are not possible um, conclusions that you might draw from this course. Because they're both self-defeating. And you will, you will, you, if you've been, done your job in this course, you know what self-defeating means. It means the minute you assert them, you thereby show them to be false. So for example, if I become a relativist with regard to truth, then what am I saying? I'm saying truth is what you make of it, and everyone is right, and no one can be wrong. But now let's say you come to me, who's not a relativist, and you say this to me. You say, Troy, truth is relative. Why are you trying to convince that there, people that there is this absolute truth that's out there? You're wrong. You hear the contradiction there? I can't be wrong according to you. According to you, no one's wrong. And so therefore, the minute you assert that relativism is true, that there is no absolute truth, then you, by that very claim, show that there is one. The truth that you say that there is no truth. See the problem there? Well, now let's go to the opposite extreme. All right, there's truth, but we can't know it. What this thousands of years conversation has shown us is that truth is impossible to get at, that we can't have any knowledge at all. That's skepticism. Again, if this is what the conversation has shown us, if this is what the evidence has led to, then we do know something, don't we? And skepticism is false. Precisely when I assert that we've proven there's no knowledge, then we've proven a piece of knowledge, that there's no knowledge, and therefore we contradict ourselves again. So these are not the possibilities. Maybe we know very little. Maybe a lot of truths are relative. But the minute I assert anything, the minute I have a view that I've drawn from the evidence that I've carefully considered, then neither of these options are available to us. 
I've started you on a hard road. That's what I hope you see in this course. I've given you tools for an investigation that hasn't ended with this course, but hopefully has just begun. I have introduced you to a skill that now you need to hone. I've shown you the options. I've given you the highlights, but nowhere have I presented a comprehensive picture. Nowhere have I presented all of the details. Nowhere have I presented all of the possible ways that each of these people can respond to each other. But what I've hopefully given you is the tools to continue that debate on your own. So what I like to say is the better picture that I should have given you with the fact that all of these people are smart and brilliant and have given us rationally persuasive pictures of the world and our place in it is more like the old story of the five blind men and the elephant. So as you see my bad art here, I've drawn an elephant. And thus, this is the elephant in the room. Now, if you've never heard the story, it goes like this. There's these five men who are born blind. They've never experienced an elephant. So they're brought to the zoo by their caretakers. And each of them, therefore, gets to experience the elephant. How else are they going to do it except by feeling the elephant using their touch? So one grabs on to the tail and says, oh, I see that an elephant, they don't really see it, but you get it. They, I, an elephant is like a rope, a leathery rope. Another says, you're crazy. It's not like that at all. They grab onto the side of the elephant. And they said, the elephant is just the opposite. The elephant is like this big leathery wall. And the other one says, the third one says, you're all nuts. The elephant is like a tree trunk. They grabbed onto the leg. And the other says, no, not at all. The elephant's like this leathery piece of paper. And then finally, the last one says, you are all dipping into the alcohol way too much. The elephant is like a snake, a long leathery snake. Now, from the perspective of the blind men, they not only disagree with each other, they contradict each other, right? And this is what you should have experienced in each of these, that each of the various points of view that we have investigated throughout the course. But also, those who know that it's an elephant will realize that not only did they disagree with each other and contradict each other, but even in that contradiction, they have all grabbed on to a portion of the truth about the elephant. Their problem was this, they mistake the whole for the part, right? They mistaked their part for the total truth about the elephant. That is truth. Truth is like an elephant. And each of these philosophers have grabbed onto an essential portion of that truth. And that's why they're so convincing. And each of them have given such good evidence to those around them who themselves have access only to that portion of the truth that their culture and their mindsets allow them to have connection to. And so therefore, that is why they've convinced their error. That is why they are still read today, these philosophers. But like any of these blind men, they're not the total truth. And therefore, the truth is out there, Scully, as it says in the X-Files. The problem is, just because there are disagreements doesn't mean important things haven't learned. So what I want been learned, and so what I want to do is now review to you what we have learned in this course, and therefore that the conversation has progressed, even though it's not completed. First, every philosopher we have studied agrees that purpose is essential for the question of the good, that our lives are constituted and essentially purpose-driven. Thus, the book, The Purpose Driven Life, is a bestseller because all of us know that without purpose, there is no life. Without vision, the people perish. But then the question is, what's still left open, where the disagreements occur is, what kind of purpose is it? Is it objective or subjective? Is it something that I've made up or is it real and out there? A purpose for my life that is true and not just something that I construct. 
Also, is it something that is in the world or is it outside of the world? Is a purpose for another world or can our purpose be fulfilled in this world and in this life alone? And then finally, is this purpose something that's a positive thing to strive for, like God or virtue, or is it a negative thing, like escape from suffering and the meaninglessness of life? Everyone agrees about there being purpose. What they disagree with are these details. And we learn something that's essential for solving this conundrum. That God, the question of God's existence, the question of a transcendent creator, makes all the difference on how you're going to answer that question. And so therefore, if we're going to solve this, we have to solve this. They all also agree that reason is essential for this investigation. That reason starts us off on the investigation and that reason is going to get us to some level of progress in answering the question of purpose. Where they disagree is whether it's merely essential and necessary or whether it's also enough to complete the task of telling us what the truth about the good is. The Buddhist would say that reason gets us to the doorstep of truth, but like a door, we must leave it behind when we enter the house. But Someone like Aristotle would say, no, reason is the sole way that we can get not only into the door of truth, but understand the whole house that truth is. And so thus the question remains, is reason enough? Reason is essential because without reason, we couldn't even tell whether reason is limited. And so what are the lessons that we should learn in all of this? Well, if truth is out there, then I could be wrong, right? But also, there's a lot that I'm right about. And therefore, everyone is like that. Anybody I'm having this conversation with is someone, therefore, that I should listen to and not simply dismiss because I disagree with them. I need to consider their evidence and use not emotion, but reason to get at what is right in what they're saying. Find a common ground. Nowhere is this more essential than in our era and in our country where there is a conflict in what? The vision of what is the good that ties together the commonwealth. What is the wealth that is common that makes our nation great? You see that without a concept of a common good, the nation is divided. And a nation that is divided cannot stand. But our problem is this, we have stopped seeing each other as people who we, whom we can, from whom we can learn because we differ, and now see each other as mere demons that are the perpetrators of great crimes against humanity. I don't negotiate with demons, do you? And therefore we need to realize that every blind man is blind and therefore is wrong but also has felt the part of the truth. Don't ask either or. The great philosophers are great because they took what their predecessors have said and integrated what was true about what they said into a bigger picture, into a more unified and illuminating picture of the nature of truth. That's why we read these guys. Are they the only ones? No, continue reading, continue searching, the truth is out there, Scully. Are you willing to do the hard work to find it? Because the most important things are life in life, I hope you realize this, are neither simple nor easy. Therefore, the most important thing in life, the good, what makes everything else important, should neither be a simple, short, nor easy investigation. Don't let the internet generation cut short your quest for truth because it can't be fit in a 15-minute soundbite.